I think we are now going to segue into the closing segment. It's been a really good day, and uh, Fifi, you're going to be leading the way on this. So over yes. to you. So we have we have got our representatives from Unido and from CEDA who have put together this platform for us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Matthias, hello, there he is, Larson from Unido and Patrick. On the resilience and the need to have uh, flexibility built into both the institutional and the individual angle of, of the approach and the various trainings that we are working with. And the need to have uh, flexibility built into both the institutional and the individual angle of of the approach of the various trainings we'll let the computer have its say that's that artificial intelligence doing its own thing and uh, i think also just uh, circling back to a point that martin made to say that in the event whereby you know the machine that you've programmed the electric car does its thing and it might not necessarily be doing its the right thing at the time the importance of human intervention just to put it back on a track but gentlemen uh to the uh both of you uh, and, and particularly matthias i know that you have been so um hands-on in the scripting of everything that went uh, on today and uh I'd like to also, uh, you know, hopefully ask that everything did go your way and uh, perhaps what you're looking forward to tomorrow in terms of perhaps a message that wasn't quite shared. Is Matthias still there with us? There, yes, I'm here. Sorry, there was a, a repetition in the in the loop. I hear you now. Sorry, I, I think I missed the question. Uh, but if, just, if you're if you're asking for that was why I was a little bit short before there was a technical issue. Um, no, my, my takeaways from today is obviously that this has been uh, an amazing uh, set of sessions. I'm, I'm also very, you know, even though I've been directly involved with, uh, with the panels and, and, you know, meeting all the people who have been uh, kind enough to spend their time uh, and discussing these issues I'm in, and I've known what they would be talking about. I'm still, you know, um, surprised at how relevant the discussions have been. So I, I, my notebook is full of, uh, of things that I've noted down for, for us uh, at LKDF and at UNIDO, th things that we, we should be thinking about when we um, think about developing new projects, uh, what actions that we should be working at, uh, providing, etc. cetera. So um, it, it's been a very, very interesting day. I mean, I, some things that were stood out to me were that um, uh, I think it was for the colleagues from ETF and OECD in the, in, in the first session, they mentioned that, you know, during COVID, um, the, both the provision and the part, participation in vocational training went down, uh, you know, a lot, like to a level it was at 10 years ago. So, so why is that? You know, my humble interpretation is that it, the systems were not resilient enough to be able to provide that training or, or even, well, it wasn't only the provision, but it was also the participation, but there was, um, something to learn from that. And that uh, example shows that we need to think about resilience in, in terms of, of uh, skills development. So I have a long list of other, other things that came up today that are uh, really relevant. Um, yeah, but maybe, maybe that would be it for now. Yes, uh, I have a question for you, Matthias. Why did you need to decide to talk about resilience specifically? in the skills development context. Yeah. So clearly, you know, we're now in a different situation that we were in a couple of years ago, obviously, because of and that's being discussed already today. But because of climate change and then, uh, you know, COVID, obviously, and now with, uh, with the conflict and the energy and, and economic and social crisis that we are uh, seeing. So all that uncertainty is, um, you know, it's affecting us all on different levels and obviously it affects uh, skills development as well. And, and I think, you know, already these first sessions today have uh, 
brought that out, how important it is to think about resilience in, in skills development. So we started thinking about that uh, quite early. Um, we realized that this is uh, a, an important issue to, to be discussed. And of course, from LKDF, it's, it's part of what we are doing that we promote discussion uh, uh, about important themes in the skills development area, but also that we help, um, I guess, facilitate partnerships. So this is one way to bring people together, to make a first connection for people I haven't met before. Uh, and then also another thing that we do is, of course, that we support uh, development of projects that, that try to address these some of these issues that we are discussing today. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Please go ahead. No, and and you know, I, I'm I'm certainly not an expert with any answers, but I I do have the pro privilege of working in the LKDF team to to be able to ask questions. And then of course, it's wonderful to uh, take part in, a, in, a, in an event like this where, where there are actually some, some answers and some really, really interesting discussions about uh, some, of the, some of the different dimensions of, of, the, of the questions. No doubt, I, I personally have I've learned quite a bit myself. And Patrick, perhaps you can also speak to why you think this is such an important topic from your perspective, I'd say that. Yeah, and I would I would uh, say plus one to everything Matthias said. I agree to everything. Uh, it is an increasingly complex world, um, and we have to be thinking about that in everything we do. Of course, including the um, educational and the capacity building efforts that we do. I would like to add perhaps one one perspective to that, uh, which comes from the multidimensional poverty analysis that lies at the bottom of CEDA's work. Because, of course, we, we are challenged in so many different ways through the, the complexity of, of the world today and how it's changing. Uh, we can talk about the uh, the lack of power and the, the access to, to voice and resources. We can talk about lack of human security and, and so on. But at the bottom of, of that uh, perspective is the access to also economic development. And economic development is the key for us to access so many other parts of our um our rights and our ability to build uh more enriching and uh, freer life so that's why having the um, the ability to have a resilient approach to your training and through to the institutions that we are building and to the partnerships becomes essential yeah all right and perhaps one more question would be your message to the donor community, social investors, and the private sector. Uh, what would you like to say to them in the context of the different pathways that we've discussed today to creating a more resilient institutions, more resilient institutions, and of course workers? If I would take the okay, if I start, Matthias. Take yes, sure. I'd love to hear from you both. Maybe you can. <laughs> I, I would say that uh, this is a very is a very important question uh, because I think here resilience spells partnership uh, because it's really in the in the partnership between the private sector, various parts of the public sector, civil society, and those of us that work in the development in, in institutions that have a particular role for development that actually spells development cooperation um, it's only in that network or in that partnership that we can we can work uh, in a resilient way sometimes one of us will have a challenge and we'll have to lean on someone else to carry a, a bigger burden we'll have different competences and perspectives as we come in to to meetings such as this and to concrete partnerships around uh, concrete educational and vocational training uh, initiatives and building around that partnership, um, I think is, is extremely important. We, we look at the development community as such, development partners, if you like. Um, 
we only have a tiny bit of of the uh, of the answer to the development challenges in the world um somebody has made calculations i would say optimistically coming up with some 10 percent of of the solution if you look financially um so it's very clear that this can only be approached um in partnerships with with different actors and that's uh, where well where the uh lkdf approach and the and the public private development partnerships provides a very, very useful uh, platform that can leverage additional engagement and funding for, for the development issues at hand. And I think that what has come out quite strongly throughout the day is how useful this platform has been from the uh, various speakers that, that have been able to attend and uh, even those that have been you know, behind the scenes. Uh, Matthias, just your message as you need or to the uh, donor uh, community and perhaps the importance of resilience, actually spelling partnerships. Mm. Yeah, I, I would also say this, the same thing, uh, partnerships for, for two reasons, I guess. One, one is that um, uh, exactly what Patrick was saying that, you know, this it takes a lot of and we were hearing this before, of course, it will take uh it will require resources and i think one point is also you know to to be resilient i think resilience actually will require a little bit more resources because it, because it means that you will have to be able to adapt you have to have extra or redundant functions or or let's say you're a TVET institution you have to invest in knowing and having some some foresight and that that's all some in on, on different levels added costs so it will it will take more more resources and and the only way to to manage to do that is is by doing it in partnerships um uh between public and private uh, institutions whether it's uh companies or donors or foundations or or or, or whatever and I, I think the other thing is the it's the what's still the, the main challenge in in skills development that there is this mismatch uh, between what people uh, the skills that people have when they graduate from from training systems and what you know is in demand in in labor markets or what employers are are in need of so that's that's the only way to to bridge that uh, match match or that skills gap is to is to work together between private and, and public sectors to to jointly try to to address that challenge and because that's uh, that's that's uh, you know the main thing about behind lkdf that's the 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 main reason for for why we are working the way we are we, we're trying to um address that challenge of the skills mismatch by bringing the private and public sector together in in direct uh activities uh in in skills development projects yeah because i mean matthias we've been working together for some time and now um uh, i've been working with the organization a bit before the pandemic during the pandemic and now at this juncture that we're at and uh I think the work that the LKDF has been doing has been quite notable in talking about the green revolution. Now we're talking about the skills revolution and also there was the digital revolution. But in 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 cementing these partnerships or perhaps even trying to strengthen these partnerships that you're talking about, particularly between the private sector and um, institutions um, in trying to address what it looks like a, is, is, is a growing skills gap pool. In your experience, in your own personal experience, what have you found? What have you found the outcomes of trying to strengthen those partnerships to be? And what have you found some of the challenges, I suppose, in trying to strengthen these partnerships? And uh, Patrick, feel free to also talk from CEDA's perspective as well, if you want to add in. Um, yeah, that's that's. Uh, if, if you go into detail, that becomes a, a big question because it, obviously partnerships is about finding ways to working together. It becomes a relationship. You have to uh, be able to build trust, and you have to uh, understand what the interests are of the different of the different partners, and how to make sure that those are aligned. That you're not uh, unintentionally working against the interests of of each other. 
and that it takes a lot of work but there are methods and there is experience in in how to do that and uh, it, it's possible uh, and it, it leads to results so trust being quite a key important element there in ensuring that hands that do shake uh, stick to the deal patrick just your take on strengthening partnerships between the two sectors as you said i mean you reached out to the donor community uh, mentioned the importance of such partnership partnerships and building resilience in your line of work and in your experience what have you found to be some of the stum stumbling blocks right now in in forging and strengthening such partnerships in this environment? I think what we will, see, what we're seeing, and unfortunately we might see increasingly is fragmentization and yes. a lack of trust. We are seeing a process where trends of globalization are weakening, uh, which implies among other things, multiple standards in areas where we need common standards, uh, multiple norms where we had come a long way on agreeing on common norms. We're seeing less, we're seeing trends. I wouldn't say we're seeing a, a, a decisive pattern, but we're seeing trends of, of lack of international open trade um, coming along. And all of these issues, they they not only challenge our current fiber of, of trust and partnerships, but also ask questions about how do we then become, how do we reinvent ourselves? How do we reinvent and, and uh, uh, restructure for new partnerships within the contexts that we are faced with? So I think that is my take, not to, not to in any, at any moment stay content with what we have, uh, again, leaning into the discourse of, of resilience, if you like, really understanding that we need to, to reshape uh, and reinvigorate, reinvigorate our partnerships. Reset, rebuild and reconfigure. I think mm -hmm. that was like the buzz phrase of, of, of the COVID uh, pandemic. But gentlemen, thanks so much to the both of you, Matthias Lassen, uh, you need on Patrick Stolfgren. Very and, good. Uh, <laughs> at at <laughs> at Sira and uh, Wale, I suppose that wraps up day one. <laughs> okay, there you go. All right, so hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, I think it's yes. been great so far. So part one done. Part two coming up tomorrow. I think it will be useful to just preview that for everyone. Thank you again for joining us. So we start again at ten CEST tomorrow. We have. I would say tomorrow is a combination of inspiration and more education, because I, at, the, at the first part of the, of the of the day, we would be getting some really interesting insights from those who are actually walking the talk, engaging people to to really build the resilience in skills. We'll be hearing the story of Nelly from Kenya. There, you also, Fifi, of course, will be. Um, moderating a fireside chat with some accomplished people who will be helping us appreciate more the the the, the things that we need that, that that cause all that we're talking about to work. And I also also be engaging some institutions. You could call it like a storytelling segment. Oh, sorry, not really storytelling, but more like a showcase segment where we'll be hearing about resilience in developing countries. So lots of stories to hear there. You don't want to miss all of it. So as I mentioned, join us again at 10 CEST tomorrow. Yeah, same time, same place. Uh, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, depending on where you are leaving us from here uh, today. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Cheers.